morning. morning. Happy Thanksgiving week. <laughs> Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has Father, we stand before you, and as we sit here looking at Thanksgiving week and all the hustle and bustle that comes with that, Father, we want to set our hearts and our minds to that place of praise and thanksgiving to become aware of your presence here and now in front of us and behind us, last covering last week, going ahead of us into the next week, Father. Lord, you're worthy of our praise, you're worthy of our breath, Father. So right now we just focus our eyes and our minds and our hearts, our spirits towards you, Lord. Remove distraction. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. 
Thank you for a place that we can come as community, as family, to worship you. Bless your holy name. cry. All the angels cry out, holy is the Lord, and all the earth replies, holy are you, and all the angels 
nations cry out, Holy is the Lord God, all the earth replies, Holy are you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Thank you, Lord. Well, if you don't have them, you can grab your communion cups. There's tables, different places. Family, good morning. Yeah, it's so good to see all of you. Hey, you can open up your uh, communion cup. I know there's always a little bit of a, an art to it, especially if you're wearing white. <laughs> Hey, my name is Derek, one of the pastors, if we have a chance to meet. We have uh, different people come up here each week and talk about, uh, Scripture gives it probably four or five names, the Eucharist, Communion, the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper. Um, you can also call it the table. We like calling it the table here, inviting people, because that's really the early church. It was really the, the center of gravity for the early church, that they would gather for a meal. It wasn't a, whatever you call it, a church service, a gathering. If you have roots of Catholicism, it wasn't a mass. Um, it was around a table, it was in someone's home. You would share a meal and part of that meal would be, would be this. So there's so much more to it relationally. But what I wanna talk about, we just have someone come up and just talk about one little aspect of what we're actually doing. And I wanna talk about this word remembrance because um, Jesus says it twice. When he, this big word, he institutes the institution of the Lord's Supper. And then Paul, and we're in 1 Corinthians, we'll get to it later on, but in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about reflecting back. And let me just read the words of Paul, but he's quoting Jesus here. And twice speaking about the bread, which we use as the body and the cup, the juice we use as the blood. He says in both of those, remembrance and remembrance. Let me just read these words and speak to that just for a moment. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 24 and 25. It says, he's quoting Jesus here. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and in the same way, after supper, so that's at table, that's at meal. Paul quotes Jesus, he says, this is the cup of my new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. So I think in this moment, what we could do is we could just kind of reflect back and remember the things that Jesus has done and his life, his death, his resurrection, and just kind of leave it in the past. Um, but this word, in what Paul's saying in the original language, and let me kind of like paint a picture for you, just follow me on this a little bit. So I've been swimming about three days a week and in the pool next to me, there's always, later in the day, there's always little kids trying to do swim lessons. And when they get farther along in swim lessons, um, you know, they've been practicing the same thing, how to float, how to float, how to float. And I hear the instructor get to this point where the kid's floating and floating and then the kid starts to sink a little bit. And the instructor goes, remember what I taught you. Remember, remember, remember what I taught you, right? And slowly, through the remembrance of that, the kid starts to float again in the pool. So here's, here's the point. It's not just cognitive. It's not just remembering from the past and leaving it in the past. For that kid in the pool, it's actually, I'm remembering what you taught me and I'm putting it into practice in the here and now. And that's actually what the word means. When Jesus says, do this in remembrance, 
when Paul quotes Jesus and says to do this in remembrance for both the cup and also the bread. It's not just, hey, let's kind of reflect back, look back to the cross, but it's actually bringing the cross, the life, the death, and what the early church would say, the presence of Jesus into the here and now. So when we remember Jesus in both the cup, the juice, and remember him in the bread, we're actually remembering that his presence, here's what our, his presence is with us now at the table with you and me. And that's so different than just the past, right? It's remembering he's always, always with you. And so what I want to do is I, I love church history. I love, I think we're so deeply connected our roots to that, obviously. I want to read from some first century um, church writings from the first apostles. It's called the Didache. And the Didache was um, this collection of writings of the early church actually saying, this is the way of Jesus. That's what they called it, the way of Jesus or the way of life. And so I'm gonna lead us in their exact words from the first century um, on how they took the cup and then how they took the bread. And we'll do it in the same manner. They said this, the first century. First, concerning the cup, we thank you as a prayer, our Father, the holy vine of David, your servant, which you made known to us in Jesus, your servant. To you, God, be the glory forever and ever. So let's go ahead and if you can, if you did already, open up your cup. We'll take the juice first today. And let's do this in remembrance of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, but his presence in the here and the now. They went on and said, next concerning the broken bread. We thank you, our Father, for the life and the knowledge of what you made known to us through Jesus, your servant. To you, God, be the glory. And even as this broken bread was scattered as grain all over the hills at one time, is now gathered together and became one. So in that same way, Jesus, let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. To you is the glory and the power through Jesus forever. So let's take the bread together in remembrance of Christ's body on the cross and in the tomb. Amen.
Father, we come before you and we thank you for your goodness, for your blood, for salvation, for redemption, for healing, for comfort, for restoration. Lord, would you speak now? Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear you through your word? Lord, we want to respond to you. We want to be transformed by you. To speak now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I was going to say good morning, but it feels like welcome to the desert. I couldn't, I felt like morning or evening wasn't a good qualifier anymore. <clears throat> Literally, I had a uh, Patagonia jacket on and like a flannel, and I was in the back room, and Derek came in with like a t shirt on, and he's like, Bro, it's like 85 out. <laughs> I'll be honest, I doubted you. I'm just publicly asking for your forgiveness. Um, but it's hot. So, um, Hey, let's just go before God really quick one more time. Father, this is your space. This is your tent. We're your people. Um, you've told us that so many times through this letter written to Corinth. And we just want to recall that to our memory as well, just like we did with communion. We're your people. We just want to hear from you. We just want to know you. And when we hear you and know you, we want to know how you want us to live with that knowledge. So <laughs> inhabit your teaching today, God. Inhabit our community today, God. I pray for your Holy Spirit to be undeniable, um, irrefutable in your movement amongst us. And I just pray that our church would be a gathering of people where your spirit is irrefutably present. We need it. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> Hey, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 today, so if you want to turn there, go for it. I was reading this week, and you kind of look backwards in order to move forwards when you're going to teach. You know, you kind of want to see where we've been and what that means for where we're headed. And as I was looking through those things, I was struck, honestly, about the story of God in the book of Corinthians. It's so clear, or the letter, however we want to refer to it, um, it's so clear to me that it is really important to Paul that he puts all of the authority for everything that's happening at the church in Corinth back in the hands of God. Everything. All of it. I mean, that's something I think we all maybe even struggle to do on a daily. But listen to these little snapshots. If you start at the beginning of the book and you work all the way up to today's teaching, look at the journey we've been on with Paul telling the story of God while he's confronting divisions in the church over and over and over again. First is that God chose the Corinthians. You see that in chapter 1. He establishes relationship with them through the, quote, testimony of God. So God chose them. God used his testimony to reach them. And then God used his power. It was the power of God that allowed their faith to rest and find its place. And not only that, but they were given the spirit of God to interpret those deep things of God on top of all of it, right? They were chosen by the testimony of God, and the power of God holds their faith, and they were given the Spirit of God so that they could understand the things of God even more. And then last week we looked at, and God was the one that was causing the church to grow. That's what was happening. God was adding to their number daily, right? Not to their bricks daily. It's not a building, right? To their number daily. We read that in the book of Acts. And then we're told that God sees those people, the church, as his field that he can grow things in, as his building that he can fortify and build up. And then lastly, as his temple that a spirit can inhabit. That's pretty rad. When you look at all of the things that God said to this point up until now, That last one really hits me, though. God's temple, right? That's what we are. Do you guys remember why the temple was given to humanity to begin with? Do you know what it was called before it was called a temple? It's called a tabernacle, and it happened in the wilderness. And there was a conversation that happened between a guy named Moses and this other guy that we call God, the ruler of the universe. And 
Moses says, we just need your presence amongst us, right? And God says, okay, I'll send my presence to dwell amongst you, right? And so the presence of God comes down and dwells in the tabernacle. And eventually they built a temple and the same principle applied. The presence of God dwelt in that temple. And so when Paul says that you are a temple and that his spirit dwells within you, that makes us, the church, the presence of God amongst the people of earth. The presence of God amongst the people of earth. Think about that. Is that not a mystery? But it's been revealed and given to us, right? All at the same time. God chose, and I'll put it on us now, us. Through his testimony, through, through the gospel, our faith is held in the power of God. It didn't come from man or through man's wisdom. It came from God. We've been given the spirit of God to understand those deep things of God. God grows the church. We're God's field, his building, and we're God's temple. I mean, that's what he's told them so far. This is their context. This is what they know about God through this letter that's been written up to this point. Hmm. The story's been strong so far with, you know, what God's done and how God moves, how God sees them. But then Paul in this text today is going to start to transition the conversation into how Paul wants to be seen on the horizontal level by other people. And it'll tell us how Paul sees himself. This is really, really important things for us to gather this morning. Paul defines the relationship in this text. Once and for all between the Corinthians and himself. He doesn't let them decide anymore. Hey, this is this. You get to pick how to judge me. You get to measure my preaching. You get to measure my teaching. You get to see how good I am. And then you get to cast your judgment upon me. You get to evaluate me. And then I'll just, I'll make sure I'm being faithful to your definitions. He's like, uh-uh, those days are done. And in the language, he really takes the gloves off here and just goes straight to the point. And he defines the relationship for them with two words. Servants and stewards. And I'll tell you right now. These are Jesus fundamentals. Jesus fundamentals. All of our higher, deeper, extravagant thinking always can be boiled down to a fundamental, right? All of it. <clears throat> it has to be anchored in the truth and the revelation of who God says he is and who God says that we are. It can't ever bypass that. We have to go back to these fundamentals all the time. And my guess is these words, servants and stewards, when we look back over our lives in the end of our days, we're going to think about these words a lot, right? As I meet with people in hospitals and converse with people who are wrestling with terminal illness, they start to look back. And the tangible things and the journeys and the paths that they've been on in this world don't matter as much as those words that they want to hear one day. Well done, what? good and faithful servant, right? That's, that's huge. Those are the words people start to dwell on. Those are the words people start to want to hear. Not, you looked great in your outfit every day. I think we'll treasure most how we grew in these areas more than all of the things that we did. Don't you? I mean, I hope that by the time I'm there, which could be tomorrow, realistically, that this would be my testimony. How we were taught by the Spirit to be a servant, a steward, I think that's what we'll treasure most, right? It won't be, oh, Justin, you were so great at leading an organization, getting people organized. Well, how did you do that? The way I see it, if all things go to plan, I've got 40 more years or so to continue to learn the way of Jesus and servanthood and stewardship, right? And I pray that today dusts those terms off for you, servant and stewardship, and that you can get back into the original biblical meaning of those words so that when you turn and start to do the things you do in your life, that you have something greater that you're living for rather than just doing the things that you do in your life. Does that make sense? That's what fundamentals are for. If they can't be threaded from your foundation all the way through to your action, from your theory all the way to your practice, then you got more to learn. That's it. That's what's so important about today's teaching in regard to how Paul 
is setting this up. So if you turn to 1 Corinthians 4, in verse 1. <coughs> I can't open my Bible because it, the pulpit I built is too small. So, sorry. It says this, it's on the screen. It says, this is how one should regard us. As servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, when Paul says the word us, he's referring to a couple of verses earlier, which is Paul, Apollos, and Cephas, however you want to pronounce it. That's my best shot. But they were leaders amongst the growing church at Corinth, the divided but growing church in Corinth. If you look at the, the idea even behind just the word us, I do believe that it is inclusive of all of the believers that were there in the church. And I'm going to illustrate that a little bit through some of the text. Paul says, this is how one should regard us. He's, de he's defining the relationship. He's saying, you can't choose to define me based on your criteria anymore. I will give you the criteria upon which you define me. Because your definitions come from a fallen mind in a fallen world, right? And I'll be honest with you. The more you live like Jesus and for Jesus, people are going to ask questions about why you do what you do. And you have to remind yourself over and over again that my orders don't come from the realm of man. They come from the Father. And I love how Paul uses some words to help illustrate that this morning. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ. Paul wants to be regarded or wants them to be regarded as servants. Not great teachers, not great administrators, not great songwriters, which are the three ways we usually qualify church leaders in our world, to be really honest with you. At least those are the ones that get the most social media FaceTime. Above and beyond all other titles, Paul wants to be seen and regarded as a servant. Period. Now think about the gift Paul had received, right? He was an apostle. There was only 12 of them, end quote, that met the official criteria. An apostle. That level of gift and responsibility plus servant, like he says, is powerful. You know, if you stop right here and you think about your roles, your titles, your self-definitions, your talents, your accomplishments, your giftedness, your track record, would you be willing to swap all of those things for the master status of servant? Would you? All of your human accomplishments, all of your horizontal approval in the realm of man, all of that given away. For the title of servant. So like I do when I teach, I try and absolutize every word I read. I take it to like the nth degree. Ryan smiled at me because I think he knows me pretty well. It's kind of how I roll. And I struggled this week and I journaled a lot about it. I struggled. I was like, okay, God, I'll walk away. I'll shed all earthly titles and become a servant. As if I wasn't doing that or didn't understand it or those things. And I always have growing up to do. I'm not like some perfect example of it. But I'm like, okay, I have to make this potent in order to drive it through all of the areas of my life. Every area. What would it look like to absolutely do that? And the first things we think about as humans is like, I'm going to move to Africa. <laughs> Honestly, right? I'm going to get away from everything. I'm going to cut off everything that entangles me. And I'm going to press on towards the goal in Christ. And usually that means Africa. <laughs> Ironically, I'm ending with a story about Africa, so don't judge me. Um, or judge me, whatever you want to do, I don't care. So I started running this through my life, and I started to realize, man, <clears throat> that's a pipe dream. But it's also a dream that I invented, right? About what it looks like to be a servant. How many of us burden ourselves with these things, right? So we like start measuring ourselves against everyone else looking at what servant meant for someone else and saying, well, I must not be a servant er er enough er The Holy Spirit whispered in my heart while I was writing, and that's why I take these things and absolutize them. And it felt like the Spirit said, no, you don't walk away from everything. I place my servants where I want them. Stop trying to define servant for yourself and step into what I'm asking you to do. 
No, I place my servants where I want them. Stop trying to define servant for yourself. Your feet are right where they're supposed to be right now. The ordinary spaces, those are the hardest ones to be planted in for Christ because they're so familiar. They're always there. The beaten path, the normal rhythm, the normal routine. Paul didn't run from his title apostle either, right? He boldly chose to operate within that call, but he boldly chose to do it as a what? As a servant, right? If you look at the word that Paul uses, this same Paul, apostle, the word he uses for servant comes from the root to row. That means something different in my house because we have a rowing machine. So we fake row all the time in my house. But it's legit. Great workout, people. But it comes from the word to row. And this is what Paul chooses because he wants to communicate what it means. The word literally means under rower. And in this text, it's referring to one who rows on the lowest level of the boat. The lowest level of the boat. And here's some kind of like further definitions. An under rower would act under direction only, ask no questions, do exactly what they are asked, and answer only to the master. Gosh, that almost sounds like so liberating, doesn't it? If I could just have one master, it would be so much easier to live in this life. They carry a singleness of purpose to row when told and how they are told. Those two things are like directly opposed to human nature, by the way. <laughs> no one wants to do any of that stuff. But imagine if we carried this singleness of purpose. Imagine how easy it would be to hear what God wants because when he spoke, there was no other thoughts. There was no other anything. We were surrendered wholly and fully to hear the voice of the Lord and how to respond. Imagine that. This is the posture that Paul wants to maintain. And if you look at even the series title that we're in, The Way of Jesus to the Corinthians, Jesus killed it in this, in this subject so well. When you look at all of the things that Jesus said, and now we look back from what Paul said and kind of reinterpret what Jesus said. Mark 10, 40, 45, what did he come to do? Serve, not what? Be served, right? But he goes on and says, and give his life as a ransom for many. Human nature is that everyone should ransom their lives for me and my control and my purpose, my calendar, my time, my strength. Jesus' nature is to not come to be served, but to serve. And be a ransom. And we see him do this. He holds fast to it. He clearly decided beforehand that he only had ears for the father's voice, period. Before he went into the garden of, of Gethsemane. Before he was run out of his hometown. Before he was rejected by religious leaders. Before he was betrayed by one of his closest friends. Jesus decided that before all of that, he would serve. Everything in his life happened upon that foundation of serve. Serve. For Jesus. Hmm. This was Jesus' guiding context, right? And John 5, 19 says it even more explicitly. And Jesus says, I don't do anything on my own accord, but only what I see the Father doing. This is Jesus, the under rower for the purposes of God. Jesus, the under rower. Why would we believe that we're not to live in the same way? This is the way of Jesus. And it's like, again, not about shedding all of our earthly responsibilities, titles, and places of influence. It's about shedding the notion that we're entitled in those spaces to make the world bow to us. And we figure out how to give our life as a ransom for others as we do those things. What does being a business owner look like in the way of Jesus as a servant, as an under rower of the purpose of Jesus? 
what does being in a relationship with a friend or with a significant other look like as an under rower? I mean, you name it, right? These are the fundamentals. They go underneath everything. And I also wondered this week, like, if we postured like this, like Jesus did, like Paul says he wants to, would we see miracles in our community, like what took place through Jesus? And I'll be really frank with you. I want to see them. I want to lean into what only God can do. I know what only I can do. I mean, I can synthesize some forms of expression. But when God breaks in and God works things, man, those people must be ready to receive, ready to hear, ready to move. This is how Paul says he should be regarded. So I, I just started praying this prayer. I wrote it in my notes this week. Father, make me a servant. I want to be the one that you use to accomplish your will. I want to lay my life before you as an instrument in your hands. This is how Paul wants to be regarded. <clears throat> so I just made a, a quick knock list, a quick checklist, and the slide wasn't beautiful enough, so I didn't make a slide out of it. To see yourself as a servant of Christ, one, the under rower believes this, that God wants to use them to advance his purposes. Do you believe that? That God wants to use you to advance his purposes? You're the under rower, according to Paul. Paul was the under rower. We're following Paul as he follows Christ, so I want to do the same thing. The under rower carries the primary foundational purpose of hearing and responding to Christ. Period. The under rower does not seek how they can be served best. But they are being called to be a servant of Christ. I mean, think about that, right? Under rower on the ship. Um, excuse me, Jesus, can I get a pad? This wooden seat hurts. Or, hey, is there an oar up there where I can just chill with you and look at how everyone's doing their job and kind of judge how everyone's doing and accomplishing what you're asking? Can I walk around, please, and, and hang out with the other rowers and, and just make sure they're doing it the right way, you know, to you know, equip the saints to do the work of the ministry? Think about it. When we lose our place below deck with everyone else, we start to adopt those other postures, right? And now I'm serving my own agenda, my own heart, my own mind, my own will, my own strength, my own experience. Man, we have to be on the, on the bottom, in the deck with everyone else. The under rower allows Christ to be at the helm, to set the direction, to set the times, to set the days, to set the destinations, to set the moments, and to be the interruption whenever he wants, no matter what I have planned. Even in America, even in our gatherings, even on Christmas Day, whatever it is, whenever it is, however you want, Father, I want to be an under rower. This overthrows human nature, right? All of it overthrows it. And my experience is that when I lose sight of my place on the boat, I stop rowing. I want to wrestle with my entitlement and my judgment, like I said earlier. And Paul's saying this. He should be regarded as one who has chosen his seat below deck, with Christ at the helm, as an under rower of Christ. And I would say this, let's be a community that gathers below deck, alongside one another, for the increase of Christ and his purposes to become even greater and greater in our midst and in our city, right? Once we willfully adopt the position of rowing alongside one another and only letting Christ be up top, Hopefully he's awake. It's not like the story with the disciples. I tried to figure out how to fit it in. I just did. It's all right. He wakes up and calms the sea. Don't get scared. I want to see this in our midst, guys. I want to see this as a, as a body. What, what would that mean for us? He goes on, and, and we hit this other fundamental, and he says, this is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. 
stewards of the mysteries of God. The word he uses for steward is powerful here. First off, it means one who owns nothing because they are owned. In other words, they're a slave. But they've been given authority by their master to manage the wealth and the operation of the household. Some guys had such good relationships with their masters that slaves, after graduating out of the slavehood program, which sometimes was seven years, and you read about that in scripture as well, these indentured servants and things of those ways, they would choose with their freedom to turn back around and still work for their boss because they formed a great relationship with them, right? They had been found faithful. They'd been found trustworthy. And in that, they found an identity and they found a place that they belonged and something that they could apply their lives to. But they wholly understood they owned nothing because they were owned. They were given authority, but that authority was the master's authority to manage the wealth and the operations of the master's household. It's interesting that Paul uses this word because if you read Paul through the uh, later New Testament where he's writing much of it, it seems like being nothing was everything to Paul, right? He really wanted to be nothing like over and over and over and over. Everything that he had, he didn't even care about. Being nothing was everything. He only wanted to be what Christ determined he would be. So that at the end of his life, all that he was was a result of the one that was going to judge him anyways. Right? He counted everything loss compared to the surpassing worth of Christ. Philippians 3.8, right? So it would make sense that these are the words that he uses. All of it. Being nothing was everything to Paul. Paul, him, Paul saw himself as, um, as one that owned nothing, was owned by God, and was given authority by God to manage the house. And I believe that this directly applies to us. He's supposed to steward. He's this one that owns nothing, has nothing, but he's going to steward these mysteries of God, right? Right? Servants of Christ, stewards of the what? Mysteries of God. The easiest translation, um, since I taught about this last time I was up here, because of my rhythm landed on both of these mystery passages, which is great. I love it. The reference is to the revealed truths of God, the mysteries of God, the revealed truths, things that weren't revealed before Christ, but through Christ have been revealed and given to us. Does that make sense? Well, what are those things? If we go to the context, do you remember the list earlier? Chosen by God through the testimony of the gospel, through the power of God. We've received the spirit of God. God is growing that church. God is growing our church. The church people are God's field, God's building, God's temple. The spirit dwells within us as the church. Those are the mysteries of God according to the context of this letter so far. So for those at Corinth, that's what they understood as the mystery of the gospel that they could step into. And I'll be honest, it doesn't stop ever. The more you pursue, the more you realize you will never exhaust the fullness of who God is. And that's meant to encourage you to continue, not encourage you to stop. As far as I want to go, he's ready. Always. So in context here, you say, well, what is, what's steward in the mysteries? It would mean all that had received the call of God, the gift of salvation, relationship with God, spiritual wisdom from the Holy Spirit that you had received from God, all of it. But what's more important is that we see that we don't own those things. They own us. And that's part of our journey. Man, every time I've taken, let's just say my gift for leading worship every time I've taken it in my own hands and tried to own it, it's resulted in like instant success and then the sugar coating comes off and it's like shortly after that, like totally without power, totally without influence because it wasn't in God's hands. I could fake it for a moment, but if God didn't call and God didn't lead and God didn't reveal, then I was not an under rower anymore. Then I was operating in my own authority again. And again, and again. 
We're stewards of what God's given us. We don't own it. It owns us. They own us. And I think Paul would put it like this, and this is a good reminder for us. Regarding God's revelation <laughs> that you've received in your life, Paul would maybe say this as I've read through uh, Paul for a lot of years now. Hey, you didn't create the revel revelation. You didn't cause it. You didn't learn it from a great speaker. You didn't earn it, but you were given it and you've received revelation from God. And now your responsibility is to steward that gift as one who has tasted and seen it. And the things I wrestle with in the gathered church everywhere is, man, we've become so much about the theory and so little about practice. We know everything there is to know about all of it and very little experiential knowledge of using it. At least it wasn't the motorcycle today. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah. He just couldn't handle listening to me anymore. You didn't create it, didn't cause it. You didn't learn it from a great speaker. You didn't earn it. You were given it, received the revelation from God. Now steward it as one who's tasted it. Live a life out of response to the things that you've been given, the revealed mysteries. You've been called. You've received the gospel. God's power accomplished this. You have the Holy Spirit. Have access to spiritual wisdom through that. You're God's field, God's building, God's temple. Now stand in those realities and say, God, where would I go? Where should I go? And how should I go there? And I'm waiting for you to tell me. And the moment I hear, as an under rower, I'm headed out. And these are the moments we're in in our lives. And Paul says, you know, that revelation never stops. In fact, when he's talking to the church in Ephesus, he prays that they would grow in their understanding of the mystery of God, Ephesians 1.17. He says that he, would, he prays that they would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. And further, it says that they would understand the height, the depth, the breadth, and the width of all of it. And by understanding, he's not just saying theoretically. That you would understand it in a way that it changes the way you live. Like Derek said with communion. Not just to look back and remember, oh, this sacred book. This book does not mean anything unless it changes your life. It's just a story. It's living and breathing and active when you read it to hear and know and experience the real Jesus. But if you just read it to know the theory, anybody can read this and know it. I have a friend who translated this as part of his doctoral program, but he doesn't believe in Jesus. He knows more about it than I do, but he doesn't know Jesus. I know Jesus. Paul wants us to grow in that. That's how we steward it, by hearing, being changed, and by having a way to live it out, living and embodying the way of Jesus. To see yourself as a steward of the mysteries of God, I would say this. <clears throat> the steward has this perspective. I own nothing, but I am owned by Christ. So their hands are open. They're not closed. They're open. Whatever you give me, that's what I got. That's a great place to be in, right? The steward stands in the authority given him by God to manage the affairs of the house. Did you know God's given you authority? Did you know that that authority is the gospel? That is the authority of God in your life. The gospel. And I'm not talking about just being saved. I'm talking about being reconciled. Every little piece of who you are going through the process of being reconciled to the Father over and over and over. And lastly, the steward is owned by the revealed truth of God. And they seek for more, and they seek to share it with others. <coughs> Paul is saying he should be regarded as a steward of the mysteries of God. And I would say, let's be a community that steward the gospel together, that set ourselves up to receive more revelation from the Spirit, that Christ would become greater in our midst.
And if you put those two statements together, imagine Newcom, whatever we call ourselves. God looks down and says, those are my people. Those people are called my church. It's great. We call it Newcom. But ultimately, we're his. Let's be a community that gathers below deck alongside one another for the increase of Christ and his purposes amongst us. Let's be a community that steward the gospel, the mystery of the gospel together. That set, and that sets ourselves up to receive more revelation that Christ would become greater in our midst and in our city. And maybe you're sitting here this morning too and maybe I scratched the theory itch a little bit and you're like, cool, right now I'm going to go home and just think about all this stuff, great. And then I started processing to myself like, God, when was, like, the most dynamic way you called me off the bench? And I would say this story is for you, if that's where you're at. Because the only way to really serve God is in Africa. <laughs> this story is brought to you by the continent of Africa. I'll be honest, I was on a trip, and God called me out pretty heavily. Um, I was gone for almost three weeks, and this was two and a half weeks into my trip. I was staying in a hotel by the Nile River, and at night when the lights were on, there was so many mosquitoes that it was scary, and all I was thinking is malaria, malaria, malaria. I had two doors on my room, so you could open one, close it behind you, and then open the other one and get in and close the door so the mosquitoes wouldn't come in, and I was already pretty worn down. I had been to three different countries by that point in time in Africa. And I went there to speak at the National Pastors Conference for the country of Uganda, and it was this radical experience. I was way out of my league, way in over my head, and it was more of a learning experience for me than an imparting experience for them. Um, and I think we have to go through these things. So I'm tired. I'm worn out. I'm conflicted. I miss my wife, etc., etc., etc. And so... <clears throat> We had this day planned to go to a medical clinic, and, and I thought, oh, this will be kind of cool. We'll go to another remote city, another remote city, and we'll check what God's doing there. And we come around the corner, and there's literally multitudes of people lined up for nearly half a mile to get medicine, like multitudes. Like, we're going to need more than five loaves and two fish for this. It was tough looking at it, and I was thinking to myself, man... I want to figure out how to just kind of sit on the bench. We've all done it. Like, I won't hurt if I kind of put my, my gifts in my holster and chill. And maybe that's you in meetings at work, or maybe that's you in relationships with coworkers, or maybe that's you in your marriage, or maybe that's you wherever. Just, I'm going to put my, put my guns in their holster and take the bullets out and kind of, I'll take the trash out or do something noble, you know, while they're all working with people. And I look in the distance when I get to the camp, and there was a giant white tent in the middle, kind of like this. And um, I, I recognized that they were trying to tell me something in their language, in their dialect. And instead of telling me anymore, they grabbed me by the hand, and they walked me over to the white tent through the multitudes. And, of course, all the little kids are trying to, like, steal everything out of my pockets and all those sorts of things. You learn pretty quick, like, never take your wallet on a mission trip, ever. I straight up saw a kid get mauled by 60 kids, and they stole all his money at a migrant camp once. It was amazing. It was one of my students in youth ministry. He emerged out of the crowd. He's like, my wallet's gone. But I was afraid of that moment. And so we moved pretty expeditiously, and we got, and they walked me into this white tent. And while I'm in the white tent, I'm sitting there by myself with no one around. And it's just basically like crickets. But it dawned on me that the people, the multitudes, weren't waiting for medicine. They had actually all received their medicine, and they were waiting for the pastor from America to pray for them. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I brought my spiritual lazy boy. I wanted to chill. I wanted to sit in the seats and listen to the guy talk and then go home and, you know, watch the Packers play or whoever's playing today. How are they doing, by the way? Good? Pretty decent? I'm, I'm really happy for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm in this tent, and I had planned on sitting on the bench, and 
I was pretty self-consumed, right? My own fatigue, my own lack of faith, if you will. And I didn't really know why I was there, except that I figured those people were probably going to come in and I would pray for a few of them. But God knew, and he had my complete int- attention. Have you ever been in that space where God like pretty much corners you in? You're like, uh-oh. All I have in here is God's voice. <laughs> I kind of wanted to like go play soccer with the kids or something, you know, and run from what God was doing. It was in a moment just like that that God completely knocked me flat on my butt. And he's like, I got a purpose for you today. And, and it was his purpose. And I, all of a sudden I was, I transitioned pretty quick. I was like, okay, okay, okay. I had this singleness of purpose in a moment. It was super sobering for me. And it became this environment where God's in-breaking ministry and movement was about to happen. But the reality is that my faith could no longer exist in theory, but needed to manifest in practice, right? And I was like, okay, I've done this a thousand times. This is great. And God was like, no, you haven't done it like we're going to do it this time. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'm going to pray for people all the time, you know. Amen, high fives, get in my car, go home. The reality is I needed to get below deck, grab my oar, and wait for my orders. And so I just decided to take the spiritual journey, right? I wanted to just sit on the shelf, full disclosure. But I awaited instruction. I had to settle into the things God had shown me, all the revealed truths God's ever given me. And I was like, I don't know what's out there. I don't know how many of them are coming in. I don't know how I'm going to talk to them in their language. I don't know anything. And so right there, Jesus had me completely. Listen, it's super easy to hear God's voice when you're completely dependent. I'm actually amazed how easy it is when you actually need to hear his voice. It's powerful to be in that place. And right there, Jesus and I shared a moment, like a crazy moment. Like, I felt like I identified with Jesus. Like, I need you, and if you don't, then I don't know how. It was one of those moments. So, my interpreter showed up. And I use big words and theoretical language a lot. Just ask Roy. He loves interpreting for me. (laughs) Yeah, sorry, Roy. I love you. Sometimes those words don't have sign words. But like Jesus, I needed God's in-breaking voice. So for hours I sat. We prayed, prophesied over with God's word. We saw deliverance from spirits, saw deliverance from demonic oppression. Christ had his way. And guess what? I had below deck seats with a window. And I had something to do. I just got chills thinking about it. Below deck seats with a window. God showed me what it meant to be a servant and a steward. There was one chunk in there where seven people in a row came to Jesus. I'll never forget it. I stopped the interpreter. I stopped the line and I wrote them all down in my journal. This lady came in and she was oppressed by this and God did this. This guy came in and he manifested and tried to attack me. But God did this over and over and over. Powerful moments. What would it look like for us as a church? to join each other below deck, to seek after revelation from God and share it with the community around us. I would just say this, get below deck with everyone else that gets it. Grab an oar, await your orders and be ready to respond to his leading. Own nothing but Jesus. Operate in his authority that he's given you according to the gospel and allow his revelation to come and administer it as he directs. This is how one should regard Paul. And so that's how I want someone to regard me. Because I want to follow Paul as Paul followed Christ. We'll shift and um, I'd love to hear just a little bit 
about what maybe you heard God say, about what God was speaking to you um, within the context of some of this. And if we're a community that believes that God continually reveals himself to us, then we should have stuff to talk about, right? And, and if, we, if we're not there yet, then we're going to keep rolling out the carpet for it because we believe that that's what the church is supposed to be. So, um, um, yeah, what did the Lord show you? We'll just take a few minutes and then we'll wrap up. Anybody? You really want to know? <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. Nope, I don't want to know. That's, that's amazing. Your why, the why behind it all, right? It actually gives you the energy to do the what. And that's just true in life. Servant and steward, servant and steward, right? You just got, um, you know, Paul says, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And only the Holy Spirit can do what you just explained. So you've been filled with newness in life. And you see what you had already planned with a new purpose, right? I want some God, please. Right? Same. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah. I don't appreciate what you said about we're not all called to go to Africa, but we're all called to be whatever God has called us to be, wherever he's put us to do whatever he's called us to do with the gifts that we have. But we can do it in our own strength and in a human way, fleshly way, and it will look a certain way and it will come off that way to people. Mm. Or we can do it, do the same thing, but in a different way, with a different attitude, maybe with different words, maybe responding differently to stress or unexpected problems uh, in a way that Jesus would do it. And it's really different. It it's almost like something has to die for me to do my job, my work, whatever it is, in a way that reflects Christ and honors him. And it, it does look different. It feels different to the people that are around us. Um, and that, I mean, that, that is true. Whatever we do, wherever we are, we could be doing the same thing, but in very different ways. And when we think about it, we can see that. People around us, how do they respond to us when we're causing a problem or when we're bringing them a, something they have to solve? Do, do they do it? Do we do it in a way that is patient and kind? Or are we harassed? Is it really obvious that way? It's just two different ways. You know, the flesh way and Jesus way. Yeah, yeah, and let's be honest, the flesh gets it done a lot quicker. Right? Especially when you have a lot of responsibilities. And especially when you want to quick fix what you might feel is a spiritual deficit, Africa becomes the answer pretty quick. Right? And my mentor told me a long time ago, I said I wanted to just go to Europe and like have a renaissance and go figure myself out. You know, anybody else wanted to just go figure yourself out? I feel like that sometimes. And he's like, you're an idiot. And I was like, <laughs> he's like, where you're standing is where you figure yourself out. You know, when God calls you those places, it'll be obvious, but it'll catch you off guard. You know, and I always, I always sat with that, you know. It's like, I guess I don't need to go across the world to figure out who Jesus wants me to be. So... Thanks for that. Anybody else? Larry. Justin. Yes. I'm glad that you reminded us that Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do himself. Yeah. Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do himself. 100%. I mean, think about that. Philippians 2, when he was reviled, he didn't. Though he had the nature of God, considered himself what? Evaluated himself. 
as not equal, right? So that he could take upon the cross for us. I mean, if there's something to have entitlement over and you're Jesus, I mean, might as well be entitled to that title. But what I see in scripture through Jesus is he actually felt entitled to be a servant and a steward of the will of God. I'm entitled to be the least. And he claimed it and held it, right? I love that. Thanks, Larry. Good old Jesus, right? Unreal. So cool. Anybody else? Yep. Yeah, when it's not in your power or your strength, when you you have the need, when you're desperate, right? Um, that's The Sermon on the Mount kind of hits on some of that stuff, right? Like, if you're hungry, but it's for righteousness, you're going to be satisfied. There's this, you know, if you're mourn, if you're in those places where you're in need of the kingdom to show up, and you find yourself in those privileged places, you'll be satisfied. You'll inherit the earth, right? One, two, three, it just goes on and on and on, and I think... There's a way of the kingdom that when we empty ourselves of our own dependence and our own strength that we're set up to receive the real version of those things, not the version we would reach for <laughs> on our own, and we're, we're satisfied. So that's incredible. One last one. Yep. Um, like you said, I haven't been called to go to Africa, <laughs> but my granddaughter has. Yep. So... For me, it's the privilege of supporting her yeah. on that mission trip that she's going on for five months, yep. starting in January. Five months in Africa. I made it three weeks once. Before she comes back to go to medical school. Yeah. Well, plans are plans until God does what God does, right? Right on. Right on. Thank you. That's incredible. Yeah. And so where you're standing, you're just as much a part of it, right? Um, one last little thought that comes to my mind to kind of wrap up is uh, <clears throat> we're a community, right? All of us under rowers, all of us rowing next to each other. I wanted to put up a like Charlton Heston like <laughs> photo of rowing, but I just figure like it's kind of trendy. So I didn't want to do that. <laughs> I was over it. Um, but I do like the Ten Commandments, Cecil B. DeMille's. Anybody else? Any uh, old school people out here? I love that two DVD set. Incredible. If you don't know what a DVD is, ask someone around. Um, but I was thinking about this while you guys were talking. And while we're talking about operating in our own strength. We're a community. Okay, We're all underneath the deck. All of us. And the reality is, if we're all listening to the Father and we're all rowing in the same direction, it can become apparent at times that there are some among us who want to row in their own strength, who want to row a little different, with their own agenda, with their own ideas, with their own these things. And I think Paul would say to restore, speak the truth in love and with gentleness of Christ. Kindness leads to repentance, but doing nothing is not kindness and does not lead to much. Let's talk to each other. <laughs> Let's tell each other when we see stuff. Hey, 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 slow down. Row with the rest of us. Or hey, 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 wrong way. Right? Let's be a community. Let's be a family. Let's do this together, right? Um, I love you guys. I love umbrellas flying through our midst. This is the weirdest day ever. Now we have wind. So, yep, we'll uh, see you guys next week, and thanks for this morning. Much love.